Hello, my name is Anna Frankenberg, and I'm just saying hello before I disappear behind my slides. So now I'm going to share my screen with you and start my presentation, which is taking a broad view of post-editing lexicography. So let me begin by asking, what do you do with lexicography? If you look up the word lexicography in a corpus, and I'm using the English Web 2020 corpus, and I extracted a word sketch for lexicography, you can see here that the only verb that collocates with lexicography as object is specialize, and there are only nine occurrences. And if you expand this to see what's behind it, by reading the concordances, you will notice that specialized is not actually being used as a verb, it's being used more as a modifier of lexicography. So what does this tell us? It tells us there do not seem to be many things that people do with lexicography. It tells us the automatic extraction of verbs that collocate with lexicography as object needs post-editing. And also post-editing lexicography is a recent concept and it's not attested yet in the English 2020 corpus. So what does post-editing lexicography actually mean? If you take a broad view of post-editing lexicography, it can mean more than one thing. It can mean post-editing material that has been automatically extracted and it can mean post-editing material that has already been published. So let me start by discussing material that has been automatically extracted. And I think these two papers are quite central. Uh, the first paper by Gregory Greffenstetter states that lexicographers may be needed less and less in the future. However, when he wrote that, they were still essential for the recent condensations that only lexicographers can provide. And in this second paper by Michael Rundell on the limits of automation, Michael Rundell argues that skilled human intervention is needed to interpret the complexity of language uncovered by corpora and also to synthesize all this information for users. Another thing that comes to mind is that e-lexicography is not 100% foolproof. And in this paper, we argue that behind, beyond skilled interpretation and summarization of contents, we need human expertise to detect slips that evade automation, which gives us plenty of material for post-editing. So I'm going to give examples of post-editing corpora, word lists, collocations, and examples. Starting with corpora, I'm going to use the PT 1010 corpus, the Portuguese corpus from the web, which was crawled by Sketch Engine team and post-processed by Pete Whitelock for the development of the Oxford Portuguese Dictionary. As a consultant for OUP, I was asked to get, do an initial check of the corpus and I found it was really good. So excellent coverage, new words, varied text types and registers and very little uh, rubbish. But I discovered it only contained the domain PT. It missed out on the domain BR and the whole Brazilian web. And this was a dictionary aimed at the Brazilian market. So this was a big uh, flaw, easily addressed. The domain BR was added, but it was a slip that was not initially seen. Another major problem, and this was more complicated, was tackling the Portuguese spelling reform. The dictionary, for obvious reasons, would only use new spellings, but the web crawl contained a mix of old and new spellings because this was a transition phase. And here you can see uh, how this impacts lexicography. So on the left, you have a some old spelling, and on the right, a some same word, meaning action, in the new spelling. And just by the shades, you can see that the results in the corpus search for these two words are completely different. So the spelling differences affected really everything, headword selection, because it affected the frequencies. 
it affected collocation, sense distinctions, grammar patterns, and even example selection. So how did we deal with it? We could convert the old spelling to the new one in the whole corpus, but this would be a massive task and maybe not a good idea. We opted to preserve the corpus integrity, but we post-edited the way the corpus was lemmatized to facilitate our work in lexicography. So what we did, we embedded the old spellings into the new spelling lemma, and where the spellings of the two varieties of Portuguese differed, we embedded the spellings from Portugal into the spellings from Brazil lemma. So here you can see uh, a lemma, new spelling lemma, and it includes the double C from the old spelling. And here you can see the Brazilian lemma for hydrogen, hidrogenio, with a circumflex accent, and it includes the European Portuguese spelling with an acute accent, hidrogenio. Next, post-editing word lists. And the example I'm going to give comes from the Collocate project. Collocate is a text editor with collocation suggestions for academic writers. And to compile our lexical database, we reused three well-known academic word lists. The academic keyword list, a subset of the academic vocabulary list, and the academic collocations list. What we noticed, however, was that the intersections of the word lists were not, uh, did not render many uh, nodes that were useful. Uh, and we needed to post edit um, the selection to suit our users and uses. We had to remove lemmas that did not generate strong collocations like actual, excessive, particular. And we had to add lemmas with major academic senses that were missing from the intersection of all three lists. And then we had to post edit collocations. So this is how Collocate presents collocations. You're writing in your text editor and you see one of the words that we focus on like advantage and you can click on it and it gives you collocation suggestions like a verb that collocates with advantage an adjective and prepositions. And if you're interested in the adjective, you can click there and it will give you more adjectives that collocate with advantage. And if you click on more, you will get even more adjectives here that collocate with advantage. So how did we obtain our collocations? How did we create that selection? We used word sketches and expert academic writing corpora. So here you can see a verb, uh, word sketch for verbs used with issue as subject in the Pearson International Corpus of Academic English. And if you click on arise, that's fine. You can see here issue arises, uh, which is absolutely fine. But if you click on surround, you will notice that surrounding is not being used really like a verb here. It's being used more like a preposition. Issues surrounding the topic, issues about the topic. So this needed post editing because we could not present surround as a verb that collocate with issue if it was working primarily as a preposition. So we needed to move it to our preposition menu and remove it from our verb menu to suit the users and uses of our tool. And then uh, we had to post edit examples. So Collocate also provides examples of collocations in context. Um, and we used uh, Goodex, which helped a lot to select our examples because it penalizes concordances with long sentences and prioritizes concordances uh, with whole sentences and the target collocation in the main clause and so on. Uh, but post-editing was still necessary to suit our project. So the Goodex concordances needed to be shortened, otherwise they would occupy too much space on the text editor screen. So we want them to be as short as possible. 
we wanted to ensure that they were very easy to process so that they would not be cognitively demanding so that a writer can concentrate on the writing and not on reading the concordances. And we want them to be usable in more than one discipline so that it could be easily transferable to different academic texts. And we want them to contain colligation cues if relevant or possible so that our writers could learn from seeing them. So this is, I gave examples of post-editing material that was automatically extracted. Let's look now at post-editing material that has been published. So dictionaries have to evolve with time if they are to remain relevant. And post-editing is needed to amend, adapt, and extend existing published material. This is driven by changes in technology, which allows for new formats and new potential. It's driven by changes in language, which makes you want to add new words, new senses, and new collocations. And it's driven by changes in society, which will affect definitions, labels, and the examples picked to illustrate headwords. So here you can see, starting with changes in corpora, in technology, um, with the advent of corpora, post-editing becomes necessary to incorporate more or new information that has been unveiled by this huge access to language data that was not there before. So you discover new word senses, uh, maybe new word grammar, and even word uses that were not recorded before, which you can integrate now. And you can also add new features like word frequency, which was not possible before corpora. Another big change in technology which drives post-editing is when dictionaries went from print to electronic. So you have suddenly more space, so you can add a lot more text. You can add examples, more examples, more collocations. You can add lengthier and more grammar explanations. You can draw attention to common errors. You can link to a thesaurus. You can add exercises, language exercises, and even provide language games with your dictionary. Beyond the text, you can link to multimedia now. So you can add sounds, images, and videos. And it's also important that dictionary users will be using dictionaries differently. So they will not be looking at a paper dictionary and opening from front to end. So the search box replaces the alphabetical order and this might influence how you present your contents. Another thing that's really important is interactivity. How do you organize menus and navigation? That's all um, something that might need post-editing because you don't want to replicate a print dictionary in e-format. And now there's also the possibility of cross-referencing through hyperlinks. Another big change is when dictionaries went online and you have real-time lookups. So uh, you can post edit lexicography as the need occurs. Like you can add more frequent updates. You don't need to wait to complete a new edition. You can update any time. You can integrate user contribution at any time, content suggestions and corrections because your users are dialoguing with you now. And integrate information gleaned from user logs like word of the day, for example. And now changes in language which drive post-editing. New words, and here is an infamous example from the Oxford English Dictionary. New senses, so here you can see elbow bump uh, exists since 1902, but recently has been um, revised and now it also means greeting. And even new collocations, so stay at home uh, exists since 1806 but recently you have the new collocation stay at home dad, stay at home mom, and an yet another new collocation stay at home order. And then you have changes driven by society. So here you have uh, the Google One box and the entry for professora, female teacher. Sense one, woman who teaches or practices teaching. Sense two, 
prostitute. Now, this is problematic and um, it raised uh, a lot of concern and uh, created um, some complaints. So this is a blog uh, saying that Google, sorry, saying that Google defines teacher as prostitute, which is not true. But anyway, uh, the dictionary behind the Google box, one box is um, made by, is um, provided by Oxford Languages, uh, the Portuguese dictionary. And I'm helping to review the Brazilian uh, Portuguese data set as a consultant. And what we're doing is we're reviewing things that affect gender, race, and social justice. So here are some examples. We're adding labels. This is the entry for boneca, doll. In sense five, it just says homosexual male. We have added the label offensive, not really supposed to call homosexual males as dolls. Here's the entry for casamento, wedding, marriage. And here you can see how we need to change the definition of wedding marriage because before voluntary union of man and woman or sense five co uh, relation comparable to that of husband and wife. This is no longer true with same sex marriage. So we have to change that voluntary union between two persons before the law or any relation comparable to that of a married couple. We also have to change examples. So there are many examples that are no longer acceptable in society. So by Shura, short height, uh, this is the original example. She's embarrassed of dancing with her boyfriend because of his short height. So what's embarrassing about being short? This is a little bit of physical appearance bias. So we change this. His short height is perfectly normal. Attractiveness. The original example, the poor girl lacks attractiveness. Uh, why girl and why poor? Um, gender bias here. So we change this, the attractiveness of a smile. Civilization, the indigenous civilization was not aware of techniques already mastered by the Europeans. It kind of gives the idea that Europeans are superior. So there's this ethnicity bias. So we change that social security is a sign of civilization. And then libido, um, the depraved let themselves be led by their libido. So it kind of shows that libido is negative, not necessarily the sexual bias. No, it's uh, not necessarily. So we change to something more neutral. He felt tired and lacked libido. So I've shown a few examples of post-editing material that has been automatically extracted and post-editing material that has been published. The question is, how much post-editing is needed? And this depends on time, cost, and quality. And altering one affects the other. So it's not an easy question. Uh, it's something that must be pondered. And I think it's useful to think this along two axes, the post-editing axis, more post-editing or less post-editing, and the user axis, lay users and expert users. On this quadrant here, with lots of post-editing, you have high quality publishable material for lay users. On this quadrant, maybe you have an overkill. You don't need lots of post-editing for expert users. On this quadrant also not so good because uh, you need to train your users to accept the slips of e-lexicography here. And this quadrant seems okay. Uh, you get fast answers with little post editing, but of course we are assuming that you have e-lex literacy. In conclusion, I think post editing should be guided by the users and uses of lexicographic material and that dictionary editors and the developers of tools to assist lexicographers can work together to improve automation and facilitate all types of post editing, whether it's automatic contents or published material. Thanks for watching. And now I will stop sharing and say goodbye and stop my recording.